So this is a paper about whether we need a new narrative about the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, uh, Atif left, but it's uh, kind of related to some of the micro issues that he was mentioning as not being that important for the macro. But um, so this work uh, that I'm going to be presenting today is based on some new findings uh, that I have in a paper with uh, the Georgian Noza, in which um, in the paper we were visiting this notion that some prime borrowers were mainly responsible for A, the boom in mortgage credit during the 2000s, but also the, the spike in defaults that we saw during the housing crisis. And in fact, we show and we sort of explain in the paper why we come to a different conclusion from a purely measurement issue, which I don't have time to sort of get into today. So I would encourage you to read that paper if you want all the details. That in fact, uh, you know, the distribution of mortgage credit during the boom was very similar to what it has been historically. So high credit score, high income borrowers got mortgages at similar rates as they did historically. And there wasn't a massive rise in mortgage credit towards borrowers who typically did not get defaults, uh, did not get mortgages uh, you know, uh, in the 90s or uh, any time uh, prior. And we're actually not the only ones to have shown this with different data. I think this has become a new uh, sort of stylized fact about the boom in the 2000s, that there wasn't this uh, massive increase of credit to low quality borrowers, let's put it this way. Instead, you know, the distribution of mortgage debt was pretty standard by historical um, criteria. But we did see during the housing crisis <coughs> Crisis of 07 or 09, very high rates of mortgage default among prime and high quality borrowers. And so the question is, why did we see that? Because that was an historical anomaly. And in that paper, we first point out that, that actually most of the rise in defaults um, you know, by high quality borrowers in the 07 or 09 peers was due to so called real estate investors. So these are borrowers who have multiple first mortgages, and hence they cannot live in all their homes. So at least some of their properties have to be investment properties. So uh, this obviously uh, you know, raised a new agenda because investors have been somewhat neglected in the academic economic literature on a real estate housing market, partly because it's hard to find them and, and see who they are in the data. So we have a particular approach, which I will explain a little bit later. Also from a modeling perspective, it's already very hard to develop quantitative macro models with the real estate sector uh, in equilibrium. If you throw in investors, it becomes uh, uh, even harder, which is what I'm trying to do in my current um, work. But it's sort of essential to think about you know, a, a number of important questions that this uh, you know, new stylized uh, facts sort of point to. In particular, what drives investor activity? Is it an increase in credit supply? Is it you know, uh, unrealistic house price expectations? Is it a response to housing demand, in particular geographical area, due to uh, moving of the population to, towards, for example, urban center? Uh, what is the relation between investor activity and house price dynamics? Um, did investors' high default rate exacerbate the decline um, in consumption and employment uh, that we saw that was associated with the housing crisis? And also, given the high default rate that I will document uh, later in the talk associated with investor mortgages, you know, should we regulate investor mortgages in a particular way? So these are the deep uh, you know, questions that arise uh, once you, um, um, uh, you know, realize uh, the, the large role of inv that investors had uh, in the 07 and 09 crisis. So what I'm going to do for today, though, is I want to give you extensive evidence, um, you know, which is going to be purely descriptive, on investors. In particular, who are they? Uh, by income, credit score, and age. And there are some interesting facts there. How do borrowers become investors? So how do people transition from not being an investor to becoming an investor? And how do they transition out? Uh, and I'll show you that essentially there is an investor class. You know, some people just are investors and they have a high churn over <coughs> high numbers of um, first mortgages. And then how much do investors borrow? And I will show you that investors have much higher leverage, whichever way you measure it, uh, than conventional uh, borrowers who just buy to buy, uh, who just um, have a mortgage uh, for their primary residence. And they default at much higher rate. But particularly, I will show you that they tend to show symptoms of defaulting strategically, uh, meaning they default, but it looks like they could continue paying on their mortgage. And then if I have time, given that we're shortening the session a little bit, 
I'll talk a little bit about the spatial of, uh, distribution of investors where there's a huge amount of heterogeneity. And I think that could be very informative to study more in detail to really understand some of the deep questions that uh, this investor activities bring, brings up. So very briefly, I use credit report data. In particular, it comes from the Experian Credit Bureau. So if you know what's in your credit report, you know what's in this data. So all types of consumer loans except payday loans, you know, information on balances, number of products, whether you're delinquent, by how much you're delinquent, uh, public record, and so on. It's quarterly, and my data starts in 2004, because when you buy the data, you can only go back eight or nine years. You know, credit bureaus have to destroy any data that's older, technically, than seven years. So what I have in my data is very much a function of when I bought it, which was 2015. So that's just to explain the start of the data. Um, so how do we identify investors in these data? So the way we identify them in our first paper that used uh, Equifax data, and uh, sort of following the literature, a paper from the, my, my colleagues at the New York Fed, was to look for borrowers who have two or more first mortgages. And you know, a first mortgage is a primary lien on a property. So if you have two first mortgages, it means that you have two properties. Now, what this um, you know, misses is people who just buy houses cash, and they may have multiple properties, and they're not borrowing for any one of them. Obviously, we're going to miss those you know, from the credit report data, uh, and uh, that's a limitation. On the other hand, if you're thinking about the effects of investors on the mortgage market <coughs> and of fragility of the household sector and macroprudential policy, maybe you care less about these cash-only investors, though, of course, they would matter a lot for house price dynamics, and so we are not seeing those investors at all. Okay? So investors for us are borrowers that have two or more first mortgages. For some of the analysis, I'm going to break it up, two, three plus, and so on. And for some of the analysis, I'll just punch anybody who has two or more. Of course, somebody with two first mortgages might have a vacation home, right? Uh, or it might be a home for a relative, and so on. Three or more, that's actually where you see the most striking difference in behavior. So those we, we, we're sort of more confident at least one of those properties is an investment property. Now, so this we documented in our original paper, um, so where we have data going back to 99, but it turns out that the surge in investor activity actually started in late 2004. You don't see anything up until 2004. So let me give you a sense of this. So this is the fraction uh, with only one um, uh, of borrowers, with only one uh, first mortgage. That would be the blue line, and it's measured um, on the left-hand uh, axis here. And this is the fraction um, of uh, borrowers with two or more first mortgages, uh, you know, among borrowers that have at least uh, one first mortgage. And you can see that there was a, this is measured on the right-hand side axis, and you can see that the, uh, the fraction of so-called investors went from about 9% uh, in uh, 2004 to a peak of about 12% um, in, uh, um, uh, just before the crisis, and then it declined dramatically. This is the log variation, so you can think about it as the percentage variation from the first quarter in the data. And this is, you know, the, the, if you want, the percentage increase in the fraction with one or more first <coughs> mortgages, which was about 10% in this late part of the boom. But the percentage increase of, in, um, of those who we refer to as investors was nearly 25%, so twice as large. So this is just a surge in investor activity, which was a very uh, stark phenomenon. Um, and um, so... If we break it up uh, by number of first mortgages, again, this is the fraction of uh, only two, green line, or three or more, right line, uh, here in percentage terms. And this is the log variation of these fractions, which is a little bit hard to see. But this is just to show you that the increase in the fraction of three or more was nearly 40% over the short three-year period. Only two was about uh, 15%. Okay, so there's this surge in investor activity, and the next thing that I want to show you, which is sort of um, uh, an extension of what we have in our original paper, is the difference in default rates across investors and non-investors. So this is a fraction of borrowers um, with only one first mortgage, blue line, that have a 90-day or more past due delinquency on any mortgage, and you can see that it goes up just before the crisis, and it peaks at about 2.25% here. Uh, in uh, 2009, early 2010. But if we look at investors, so people with two or more first mortgages, the rise is much higher, and it, the peak uh, is nearly close to 
Now, if we look at foreclosures, the difference between investors and non-investors, and something I'll return to later, is even starker. So if we look at foreclosures for non-investors, obviously there's a rise. These are very high rates historically, but it's very modest compared to the rise in the foreclosure rates of investors, uh, which reaches a peak of 1.5% um, you know, here at the high school prices. So what I want you to take away from this is um, there was a surge in investor activity. It was relatively large. But what's really striking here is the difference in default behavior between investors and non-investors, which is a very, very large difference in default. Now, if we look at the share of all delinquencies and all foreclosures driven by investors, remember that the investor share is about 15%. So the share of delinquencies um, uh, um, by investors, which will be this green line, and it's measured on the left-hand side axis, you can see it peaks at about 23% at the crisis, whereas 14% of all borrowers are investors. So the share of delinquencies is twice as large as the share of borrowers who have this feature. Uh, but if we look at the share of foreclosures, which is measured on the right-hand side axis here, you can see that at the height of the crisis, the share of investor <coughs> foreclosures was close to 50%. Okay, so 50% of all foreclosures were um, accounted for, for by about 13 to 14% of all borrowers. So that's a very, very stark difference in behavior. So that's give me, uh, let me give you a sense of who these investors are. So this is a share of investors by quintile of the household income distribution. And you can see that the share of investors is disproportionately large in the top quintile. Okay, but you can also see, which is, you know, 16%, you know, goes up to 18% much, much lower, very uh, large gap for the lower quintiles. You can also see though, that in percentage terms, the growth in investor activity was slightly uh, larger for the lower income quintiles, though you know, investor share is much higher for the higher income uh, borrowers. If we look at it by credit score, so uh, this is different types of uh, credit score categories, you can see that um, most of the growth in investor activity was for prime and near prime borrowers. Okay? So going back to the subprime narrative, near prime borrowers are borrowers with a credit score from 600 to um, 660, so they are less than prime, but most of the growth was indeed for prime borrowers. Uh, and you can see that the income distribution of investors didn't, go, didn't change very much um, in uh, before the crisis. The only anomaly that we see in investor activity pre-crisis is the sharp rise in the fraction of investors who are young, or the fraction of young borrowers who become investors. So you can see this is by age. So the orange line is 20 to 29 year old, all the way to 70 to 80 year old. So most investors are middle aged. Perhaps not surprising. But what we see in the boom here, there's a, uh, more, a nearly doubling of the, ra uh, the rate at which young borrowers become investors, which is really interesting. So, you know, these are uh, high income young borrowers, but nonetheless, they might be less experienced than older investors, and that might drive some of the differences in behavior. Now, um, let me uh, show you a little, bit, um, um, a little bit of information of how borrowers become investors. So to see this, I'm going to show you some evidence on the transition from an, a given number of mortgages, say zero, to another given number of mortgages, say one. So zero to one is you weren't a homeowner, you become a homeowner and, and you borrow. <coughs> one to two, you become an investor. <coughs> Three plus, you become a more intense investor, if you want to put it this way. Um, so this is the zero to one transition. Uh, that's the red line. And the zero to two plus transition, uh, that's the blue line. Um, you can see that uh, you know, the zero to one is measured on the um, uh, right axis. So actually, we don't see, we see a decline in these transitions um, you know, over this period. But the zero to two plus transition kind of rises here in 2004. So there's an intensification at the rate at which people go from having no mortgage to two uh, or more mortgages. Um, so these are the transition from one to two and from one to three plus. Um, as you can see, one to three plus is a very small rate um, here. Uh, one to two uh, is about 3%, and you can see that it uh, drops dramatically during the crisis. Okay? But what I want to show you next, which I think is quite interesting, is the transitions from two to three and three to four, which are measured on the right, uh, um, on the right graph here. This is the graph from before, one to two, one to three plus. What you can see is while these transitions are in the order of 3%, and you know, less than half of 1%, these transitions are respectively 5 and 
What does this tell us? If you already have two mortgages, you're much more likely to get three or more. Uh, and um, if you have three mortgages, you're very likely to get the fourth one. So this really seems like there is an investor class of people who essentially, um, you know, um, are investors and so transition you know, into a high uh, number of first mortgages. And this may be driven by flipping behavior, but in any case, you know, they are sort of experts uh, at this at some level, whereas most borrowers just have one mortgage and they're very unlikely to uh, transition to two or three or more. Now, uh, let me show you what I think is the uh, most striking um, results. Uh, which is the leverage as well as the default uh, behavior, particularly the strategic behavior. So uh, it turns out that investors borrow a lot more. This is obvious. They have multiple first mortgages, so they have higher mortgage balance. But they borrow more in different ways. So this is the average per mortgage balance um, by number of first mortgages, one, two, or three plus. So this is the per mortgage balance. So what you can see that investors, two and three plus, have much higher average balances on each mortgage than um, you know, non-investors who only have one first mortgage. So not only do they have higher mortgage balances because they have more mortgages, but on average, they have larger mortgages. What's even more interesting is that investors, relative to non-investors, are more likely to have second mortgages. So this is the fraction that have a second mortgage by number of first mortgages. You can see that it's nearly um, uh, five percentage point higher at, at the height of the boom, uh, the propensity of investors to have a second mortgage versus non-investors. And this is the fraction that have HELOC, uh, um, that he have HELOC lines Again, this is more than twice as large, about 35% at the height of the boom for investors and non-investors. And perhaps most importantly, if we look at um, you know, the, um, the payments on first mortgages and second mortgages as a fraction of their income uh, at a monthly basis, for investors, only on first mortgage, the payment to income ratio is about 35%, whereas it's uh, about 16% for non-investors. And then when we go to second mortgages, so this is monthly to um, uh, payment to income for second mortgages is about 8 to 9% for investors, and it's only about 6% for non-investors. This is conditional on having a second mortgage. So the, all these measures tell us that investors are more highly leveraged than non-investors, which may perhaps then explain the difference in behavior. So I've already, in default behavior, I already showed you that investors default at higher rates. They, they have higher delinquency rates and they have higher foreclosure rates. What's really interesting is that investors who become delinquent have a much higher probability of transitioning into foreclosure as opposed to curing their delinquency. So this is the transition rate from a 90-day delinquency to foreclosure by number of first mortgages. So the green one is only one, a red line is two, and the purple line is three or more. So you can see that there's a stark difference in here in the propensity <coughs> to go from a mortgage delinquency that's quite severe, that's 90 days, to a very severe mortgage delinquency, which is a foreclosure leading to repossession. And um, uh, what I'm also going to show you is the fact that there is evidence suggesting that investors tend to default strategically. So the question uh, related to that is how do we measure it in the data? So we use a measure that um, is um, sort of based on uh, an industry practice or definition, which is to say the following. So um, you default strategically if it looks like you go from being current or having no delinquency to a severe delinquency on a mortgage, but you have no other delinquency. Whether, whereas you, dis, um, you default because you're distressed if you show a number of different delinquencies on your credit reports on different types of products. The idea is if you go from being current to severely delinquent very fast, just on your mortgages, but you're able to make all your other payments, maybe you have a reason to default on your mortgages, but in fact you could indeed continue paying, um, uh, but you're able to, uh, to make your other payments. And so this may be a strategic default on the mortgage. Obviously this is a proxy, it's not, we don't don't know. We don't. We can now ask these borrowers whether they default strategically. If we, if they if we could, they probably wouldn't tell us. But it's a way to capture uh, strategic behavior as opposed to distress behavior. So um, this graph shows um, the share of all defaults that can be classified as strategic uh, 
uh, for borrowers with, that have only one versus two or versus three or more first mortgages. So you can see that for all borrowers, there's an increase in the share of um, 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 defaults that can be classified as strategic during the crisis. Uh, but the share of strategic defaults, especially for borrowers with three or more mortgages, is disproportionately large compared to all other borrowers. It goes from about 20 to 25% to a peak of 35% of all defaults for uh, borrowers with three or more first mortgages, possibly being considered strategic. What you see on the right hand side here is the share of defaults that can be classified as the stress. Um, and you can see that it's higher uh, for uh, borrowers with only one first mortgage and slightly lower for borrowers with two or more during the boom. Uh, but as we get uh, you know, to the crisis, the gap between uh, investors and non-investors uh, open up consistently with this gap uh, here in the share of strategic defaults opening up. So given that I haven't shown you ge geographical information, I'm going to just conclude uh, you know, with this slide. You know, so what uh, do we know about investors? We know that they are substantially more leveraged um, and they are more likely to default strategically despite the fact that they look like they don't, you know, they have high income, they have high credit score, and they're not the types of borrowers that you would expect to default. Now, going back to what policy questions this raises, I would argue that it's really important to think about who is defaulting and why they're defaulting to, in order to structure you know, policy responses to uh, a, a crisis or an increase in defaults, but also that the macro implications of investors versus you know, a more general class of borrowers defaulting are, are also quite different. Uh, and so that's why I think we really need more research you know, on investors that seem to be very key in sort of driving uh, you know, uh, housing market behavior uh, and, and equilibrium fluctuations in the housing market to understand what their role is better and thinking about policy that sort of focuses them on them a little bit more. Thank you. So let me go over the key takeaways from this paper. Uh, uh, Stefania presented really well those key stylized facts and, and scripted. Uh, descriptive facts about investors. Uh, there are about 14% of all borrowers that had a much, much larger share of foreclosures than previously known. Almost 50% of foreclosures during the, the peak of the, of the crisis in some months. And, and, and very interesting, uh, uh, they're way more likely to default strategically according to the definition of strategic default used in the paper. Almost 35% of them uh, at the, the peak of the crisis. Uh, and then more interesting stylized facts about the activity uh, late in the cycle in high densed metro areas and in areas with high price fluctuations. Um, and, and those key takeaways, remember, are related to subprime lending in the 2008 crisis. Do we need a new narrative? That's, that's the title of the paper. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this discussion in two ways. First, I'm going to quickly go over a couple of things that uh, could be improved in terms of the definition of those variables. They're not major criticisms. They're literally it's new work. There's, there's an extra room to improve it. Uh, and, and they're related to the definition of those variables. Uh, first of all is the definition of investors, at least to first mortgage transactions. I, I really like this, this definition. I think it's the best one uh, that we have right now. Um, and, and better than most other proxies used by other papers, such as flippers or, or houses that are bought by, by companies, LLPs, LLCs, even when they're individuals, not just like uh, homes for rent and so on. Now, there are certain limitations. Huh? So you have, you have a smaller, more limited set of investors just because of that. You, you don't have those companies. You don't have the more professional investors. I think you don't have the households that name themselves as an LLP or LLC, I think. So, so, in, in, uh, so, so that, that's an issue, and I'm curious to know what's happening to those, and if you can identify them somehow in your data. Um, uh, my own research, I found that they don't do things very differently than households and the prime uh, uh, borrowers, but, but I don't know. In addition to that, uh, you're calling investors, and I think that's okay. But then you have the set of homeowners that have vacation homes, that they have multiple homes because maybe they have multiple jobs in different cities, or they have homes used by family members. And I think they're all in that, in that mix. And I think it's important just, just, to, just to explain that in more detail. 
and, and, and do as much as you can uh, to provide uh, robustness tests. And maybe even compare to the rest of the literature that used some of those definitions. And again, that I think they're not as good as yours, but you know, doesn't mean that you have a, the perfect metric here. And I have here some examples that, uh, uh, you know, can you identify flippers? Uh, do the more professional investors exhibit similar behavior or not? Um, I think it's very important. Uh, second one is the definition of strategic default. Is, is defaulting on one mortgage and not in any other debt. In a, in a, this is a pretty stringent you know, uh, a view of strategic default, which I like it too. I think that's the best one that we have so far. That's great. Um, but again, it, it, it's a proxy. Yeah? We don't really observe the, the homeowners deciding what to do and how they're making those decisions, and especially how they're considering uh, what to do in a moment of, of potential crisis. In, in or, or because of some, some income shock, or because they're seeing their investments not achieving that return, or they're afraid of a, you know, additional fall in prices. Um, so, so, so given that, you know, there are different versions of, of the meaning of strategic. Huh? If you look at the old literature, um, in, in all the theory, it's mostly about one household, one family, one job, Word about negative equity. Oh my God, I have too much debt in this house. And, and there's all sorts of trade-offs related to the consumption value of that home and the hitting the credit score and so on. And, and in the paper, you, you talk a lot about it, how the investors have different incentives. But I would like again to do more, to think about the theory a bit more, how, how given how there is a portfolio of houses versus just one home, and the incentives are so different, how should you think about it? Moreover, there may be different degrees of, um, of, um, of strategic default in your data than you classify. Because sometimes it's not in any other debt. How about, you know, sun default and sun debt? Um, I, 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 think, I think your data is so rich that you can have several versions of a strategic default. And I'm, again, I'm really curious to see how they behave and what you can tell us about them. Uh, and then similarly engage with the previous literature, uh, like uh, this, this paper by Gerard et al., where they, they also find very big effects that almost, uh, if I remember well, almost half uh, of the foreclosures were strategic in that paper, as opposed to being uh, a consequence of a job loss, of a negative income shock. So in terms of the magnitudes, I think our paper more or less matched those results, but your data is just much better than, than, than their work. Okay. And of course, you, you already talked about key policy implications. This is, this is critical for any type of policy design bailouts uh, and the feasibility of the desirability of, of them. Uh, let me spend more time uh, talking about the title of the paper. Okay. So the title of the paper is this new narrative, but it mostly talked about uh, you know, investors in part of it because we have previous work that is focusing more on this new narrative, and that's, I think, that's the most important message for this paper. What exactly is this old narrative? You know, we have, you have, if you need a new, you need to describe the old one in more detail. And the old one, in my view, is, it starts with the popular press, and all those media rants that came with the, with the, great, the, pre, the, the great Recession, the initial the crisis, pretty much blaming uh, poor and minority borrowers because they're the first ones uh, uh, to default and to foreclose on their mortgages. Um, is, is that still alive? Oh, probably yes, if anyone checked Twitter, especially you know, the president saying all sorts of things about migrants and, and poor and minorities, blaming them forever. Uh, back then, the blame was you know, housing crisis, today other, other things. Now, in the academic press, it's is basically Mian and Sufi, 2009. And, and Mian and Sufi was one of the early papers. It's the most cited paper. You know, it's have two, almost 2,000 citations. And they basically say, you know, the, the mortgage crisis was caused by the expansion of credit to those individuals, those families, with low credit scores, mostly for individuals and minorities, a lot of really high share of minorities. So, and, and that became the dominant academic view of what caused the housing crisis, the housing bust. Uh, is it still alive? That's, 
The answer is, is more clear, is no. So that narrative is completely dead. It has been completely debanked. Okay? And that's why we need a new narrative. Because this one is gone. And it's gone because of all those papers by, by a number of researchers, including uh, Stefani and her co-authors, showing that, and that's what uh, Stefani briefly mentioned at the beginning, the expansion of credit was widespread. spread. was a middle class event. It was the investor's event. And very, very, very late in the cycle, credit was expanded towards poor people, minorities, people with uh, low credit scores. Okay? Uh, I have a couple of figures here. Um, uh, part of, and by the way, part of the problem is not that they are, you know, my chief's not here, it's not that he's a bad person, it's that <laughs> there is, <laughs> there is, definitely should not relate to, you know, to the president. Um, it, the research was done very, very early in the cycle. You know, even though it was published in 2009, the date was up to 2007. And there was a huge demand to produce a sun answer about what is going on. And when there's this huge pressure to produce answer, that's, that's what we do. We say, well, let's, let's investigate this economic event with the data that we have. And that's what they did. So, but then the problem is in 2007, they had very, very limited data. Only a few MSAs, only the data for subprime. They couldn't plot figures like this that shows the, the share of funding sources for all homes, not just recent transactions. And then when you do that in all those other papers in this work, you see that prime loans, the share of prime loans was increasing during the 2000s. Subprime loans are definitely increasing too, from eight to 20%, but at the expense of subprime governmental loans. It's almost like a crowd out, a one to one. That's just what happened. Uh, and, and again, in hindsight, with more time, we now we know this, we didn't know in 2009. And same thing with the foreclosures. So when Iman Sufi wrote that paper in, with the day in 2007, everything was still in the very beginning. And they observed more foreclosures in the subprime sector at much higher rates. But then over time, you know, the prime just dominated. You had way more foreclosures in the prime sector. And, and, and what Stefani is doing right now, he said, let's look at in more details. Are those all households? They're all homeowners or they're, or they're investors? Because maybe a, a really large fraction of those foreclosures, uh, you know, or uh, you should blame, I'm not sure blame is the word, but should blame on uh, investors. And, and I think that that's, that's a very important part of the new narrative. I don't think we still have a completely new narrative, even for the Great Depression, we're still studying it today, signed this paper. So I think for the Great Recession, in the years to come, we'll still see many papers and we'll, that, and we'll cover many new facts about it. And, and then try to figure out uh, you know, uh, uh, an overall theory to deal with the situation. But let me give you some, some facts and this is a very limited set of facts. See how complex the problem is. Those housing booms actually started at the local level in mid late 90s. It's, a, you know, nothing started in 2004 or 2005. It's mid 90s. And, and in both coasts and how it spread over the country, it, was, it started with fundamental shocks, both related to supply constraints and real wage gains of the people that initially bought those homes. Now, uh, it may have a small importance of behavioral factors, and not even shielded, but the empirical work by Sue showed that you know, some behavioral factors were important too. So it's not just fundamental, there's some behavioral on that too. The financial sector was important, credit was relevant, but it happened with a lag, a lag of at least two to three years. You have those local markets booming, Prices increasing, and only after that you have an increase in lending. Okay, uh, and, and in many papers that are talking about it, including the subprime papers, and then very related to the party. And, and, and by the way, those this financial sector contribute to exacerbate the boom. And then very related to the cycle, you have the investors. That's the you know the paper by Stefania. You, you have speculation. This is the paper by Defusco, Nathan, and Zuick 
uh, you know, Stefan, it would be great if you could replicate some of those results with your data, because have better data. They have a slightly different view from you. I think you're saying they come late in the cycle, and that's what they wrote. I think they think it's, it's a bit earlier. So it would be nice to, to see that comparison. And then, and, and then worst of all, the poor people with the lowest credit scores and the minorities, they, they arrived to the part extremely late. Buying homes for the most part in 2006, the worst possible year, because that was the peak of house prices one year before the crisis, and they're the first ones to default. Stephanie didn't show the data, but the foreclosure rates for minorities are extremely high in 2007, 2008, because guess what? They're the ones that lost the jobs first and bought the houses the latest and suffered the most from the cycle. Uh, and now we're learning that the investors had more or less the same behavior, but those households was because of job loss, income loss. The investors more because of strategic default. Um, and then you have other factors here that we can think of. So it's, it's a very complex story, a very complex set of, fa of facts. It, it takes a village, you know, there's no such a thing as one paper, you know, this is the paper that describes the whole thing or a theory that describes the whole thing, we still don't have that, we're very far from that. It's gonna require a lot of time, a lot of new papers, a lot of replications, which means we really need to be a bit humble and present any type of early estimate or any type of estimate, because it's very likely that we're picking up a very small part of the story. And, and I think, you know, Stefani is, and Qualtrics is doing a great job in providing more inputs to this new narrative. I think it's great, Congre great congratulations to the work that they're doing. Uh, I'm, I want to see more, uh, but, but keep in mind is what there's still a lot to be learned about so many interconnected mechanisms. Supply constraints, demand shocks, financial market responses, investor activity, behavioral factors, a lot of heterogeneity in how all those agents behave. Many spillovers, both geographic spillovers and across institutions and homeowners. All the governmental regulation interventions. And in, in, in more and more we're learning about the pieces and bits and pieces about this puzzle. Um, eventually get there. I hope it's not gonna take 100 years or 200 years like the Great Depression, but um, uh, I'm a bit optimistic moving forward. So, especially because the papers like uh, stuff like this. I just have a quick question. Do you think the investor activities is reflective of credit supply shocks or credit demand shocks or a combination of both? So I'm sorry, I may have missed something at the beginning. So the credit scores are for individuals, but we're also talking about households. So how do you reconcile those two? Because I was thinking about this, and I said, wait a minute, I have two first mortgages, I'm an investor, but my household has three. So we don't view, we view ourselves as homeowners. This is a messy issue. So there's two questions, and then one in the, yeah. Yeah, I, I would um, just question if, um, you thought about the fact that non-investors are often people who had their mortgage for a long time and paid them off, and therefore have lower leverage, whereas investors tend to maximize leverage. And um, also, of course, people, in my experience, tend to try much harder to avoid default and foreclosure if they're actually living in the house that's being foreclosed on, psychologically. Okay, I'll actually start uh, with the last question, if that's okay, uh, because we sort of talk a, a lot about this in our original paper, and we argue that exactly one of the reasons why you should be expecting higher default rates for investors is that they don't have to pay the cost of having to move, you know, having to relocate, having longer commutes, their kids have to change schools, and so on. And actually, the industry is very well aware that on average, investors have higher default rates. So for GSC-sponsored mortgages, if it's an investor mortgage, there's a pricing scheme that, you know, charges you higher rates of uh, interest rates and insurance. And another reason why investors may have higher default rates, they cannot protect investment properties in bankruptcy if they do become actually financially distressed, and they might have an incentive to leverage more. So we, uh, we, so that's, uh, I think, you know, if you are an investor, you would have a lower cost of default because of these reasons, and that's why one of the reasons why we observe higher default rates for investors. Uh, but then, um, going go, go back to your point, that's sort of a measurement 
measurement issue. So this is individual level data. I have no way to match, you know, couples. Uh, uh, so um, it, all the mortgage balances are adjusted for joint accounts. So it's not I'm not double counting mortgages or mortgage balances. Uh, but um, you know, if I see you in my credit report data, you're an individual with a certain credit score, and there's a mortgage balance attached to you, which is adjusted for joint accounts. So I'm getting certainly the level of balances and on the number of mortgages right. I have no way to link households. So that's sort of like a measurement error, if you want, or issue problem, which is intrinsic to this data. There's not much I can do about it. With respect to your question, uh, we, do not actually, we do not actually take a stand of whether it's a credit supply or a credit demand shock. It could. So what um, is it, true is that in uh, late 2004, exactly when um, investor activity surged, there was a big decline uh, um, in um, uh, you know, the, um, the spread between mortgage rates and other long-term rates, and in particular for, um, you know, uh, um, non-conventional mortgages. And so this coincided as a timing factor with the surge in, in mortgage activity. So you could argue there was a credit supply shock and investors took advantage of it. You could also argue that you know, given that it, the industry was very well, that investor mortgages are more risky. If there are unrealistic or over-optimistic housing price expectations, and even if you make a risky uh, you know, mortgage, you don't think you're going to lose much from it because house prices are going to go up. You're going to give, you know, more favorable condition to a riskier mortgage, and that led to, you know, the surge in investor activity. With our data, we are not taking a stand on why that happened. What we argue that identifying, you know, who, you know, if you want, benefited or contributed to the boom and then who defaulted is really important for thinking about particularly policy responses and how we interpret other episodes. So right now, there's actually a, has been a surge in investor activity in the last two or three years. It's somewhat different. There are more institutional investors and so on. Um, but I think the fact that we've overlooked investors in the 2000 booms is shaping the fact that um, People are not particularly worried about the certain investor activities, and though a lot of things look similar to what they did uh, in the early 2000s. Um, and other than that, if I can take a minute to just respond uh, quickly, I'm very uh, grateful for the comments. Um, I just want to say something about uh, you know identifying a strategic uh, default. So the way I was originally thinking about strategic default is that you defaulted just because your house was underwater and it wasn't a viable financial investment anymore. But then you know the findings that I have on the high payment to income ratio for, for investors, you know, coming from the fact that they had so uh, so much um, such high leverage, sort of got me to thinking that you know you could be strategic in defaulting because you can't make payments and. That would make it hard to distinguish, you know, strategic default for an investor that has high monthly payments on all their debt products from maybe a low-income household who loses their job or their hours are cut and are not able to make payments. So I think, you know, with better data, perhaps we can make some progress on different types of strategic, um, uh, you know, defaults or just defining strategic default better. And then I want to conclude with this issue of data, because I think a lot, and this is sort of uh, dovetails on what um, you know, uh, Fernando was talking about, we do not have good data in the United States, because we either observe borrowers quite well, like I do in my data, or you observe lenders quite well, or you observe products. So Alt A mortgages versus GSC mortgages. We do not have a data set, really, where you can see all aspects at the same time. And I think this has caused a lot of the confusion Fusion because in the media very often subprime mortgages are mortgages made by non-conventional lenders that are listed in inside mortgage finance as a bunch of institutions who make non-conventional uh, mortgages, but they might make them to high credit score borrowers. But because they're investor mortgages, they're not going to be GSC mortgages, they're going to be out A mortgages. And we do not have a good data set where you can see all the aspects. And I think we, this has really fueled uh, the confusion and the debate about who borrowed, who defaulted, what of loans, and it would be great to just have better data. So.